네, 감사합니다. 어, 이런 아침부터 많이 찾아주셔서 감사합니다. 제가 양해해 주시면 영어로 진행하도록 하겠습니다. Uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the Asan Institute for Policy Studies. Uh, we have a very special lecture this morning. Uh, he's, he's, a, uh, he's a frequent visitor, uh, and he's already spoken numerous times at the Institute. But amazingly, he, he always talks on a different topic. He never talks on the same topic every time he comes here. And it's always very deep and profound and always very helpful. In fact, uh, what, what, what happened was that when, uh, when the uh, uh, Sewol ferry tragedy uh, occurred, I mean, we are all in Korea going through a, uh, a truly soul-searching period. And I think as many people observe, this will hopefully turn out to be a turning point uh, in our development history of our, our economic and social and political development, uh, a, a turning point where we go to the next stage, uh, a more mature stage in terms of, a, of, of the uh, evolution of the nation. And uh, um, there are many ideas. Uh, from the president on down. Uh, but at the same time, uh, it seemed like an, something that we need outside opinion on. Uh, we need some objective opinion on, on, on what it is that uh, we should be looking for, what it is that we need to be doing. And so I was th thinking, who exactly should it be that, that uh, we invite? And of course, it didn't take me very long before uh, coming up with uh, the name of, of Guy Sormang, uh, who is a writer, intellectual, professor, editor, politician. He just told me that he started a business of media, some kind of a media business. He's, he's trying to become a media mogul as, as well, it, uh, it seems. But uh, uh, I asked him about uh, this, uh, about doing a, a lecture, and the title he gave me was The State and the citizens' uh, safety. And I think we couldn't have come up with a more, he couldn't have come up with a more appropriate uh, title uh, than this. Um, so uh, I've asked him to speak. He said he'll speak for about 40, 45 minutes. And then we will then go into a Q&A &A and, and discuss and hopefully have a, uh, uh, a, a really uh, informative and profound discussion, which I, I have no doubt we will. So please join me uh, in welcoming uh, Mr. Gitsur Mom. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, uh, yeah. <coughs> Uh, good morning, and the, uh, when the, uh, Dr. Chai Bongham called me um, less than two weeks ago when I was in New York and asked me if I was ready to, to talk uh, about the so Sewol tragedy, and the, uh, my immediate answer was yes, of course, uh, because uh, as the, everybody knows, I'm a, um, I'm a friend of South Korea. I come here on a regular basis since uh, many, many years, I think 30 years. And the, um, in a way, I mean, the Seoul tragedy was your tragedy, but it also was mine. And the, the first reason I, I'm, I, I'm, I'm here um, is the, uh, to, to share with you the, 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 the grief and, the, uh, and the, the grief that we should all share about um, an accident which is more than accident. It's an accident which should never happen. Accidents do happen, but some accidents uh, have meaning uh, which go uh, beyond I mean, immediate circumstances of what really, uh, really happened. And so I thought my, my duty was to be here, and especially in this institute, um, uh, because in a way, I mean, I've been part of the life of this institute uh, since its, its very beginning. As, say, as Dr. Ham uh, immediately, um, recently uh, said, I mean, the, our uh, the immediate reaction of the Korean nation uh, beyond uh, grief uh, uh, toward these poor kids and the, their family is that um, something more that was involved and maybe, and you, do, you never know, but sometimes you feel that in nations some events are, are very significant 
and are kind of a turning point in the history uh, of the nation. I mean, the, the, the Sea World tragedy um, uh, may be the beginning of a new, uh, a new world, or at least uh, a new way of thinking about the future of South Korea. Um, South Korea has been a successful story uh, from the very beginning, uh, but I wouldn't say the end of the success, but maybe some policy shift and some deep uh, thinking about the way uh, the, the country is managed, the way the country is going, uh, maybe the Sea World tragedy, if this uh, call to think more about the South Korean model and the way public policies are implemented. And they, maybe this, these uh, dead kids and their families are, in a way, uh, uh, screaming to us, I mean, think about us, and the best way to think about us is beyond grief. Uh, maybe it's a kind of a deeper revision uh, on the, the, the way things are managed so that this kind of accident will never, uh, never happen again. And my, my third observation, um, because I tend to be optimistic regarding uh, South Korea, uh, um, the, this tragedy uh, brought back the, the, the memory of another, another uh, tragedy. Um, you, you may remember that in, uh, between 1990 and 1998, uh, uh, if you happen to fly Korean airline, you should not. Uh, uh, Korean airline was the most among the most dangerous airlines in the world, and they, uh, it was a, a company which was a uh, uh, accident prone. I mean, seven. Just to give you a comparison, I mean, the, uh, uh, if you took America, if you could took Korean airline versus American airline, you have 17 times more chances, if I may, know, or chances. I don't know if the right word. At 17 times more risks uh, to crash to crash with your plane. And the, uh, um, after this series of accidents in 1998, uh, Korean Airlines decided to, to, to call for foreign experts and try to understand why so many accidents happened to the national airline company. And it appeared that the, uh, uh, all, none of these accidents had technical causes. All of them uh, were the consequence of human errors. And not any kind of human errors. It had to do with the behavior of the pilots in the cockpit when confronted to an unexpected situation. Because of the training, because of the kind of education and training and sense of hierarchy uh, uh, which was pervasive in the Korean society, but also in the Korean airline cockpits, a crash did happen. And the decision uh, which had been made uh, in 2000 uh, was to totally change the culture, the training of these uh, Korean teams, uh, Korean airline teams, <clears throat> and to inflict to them what has been called the cultural shock therapy. And after this cultural shock therapy, <clears throat> the behavior of the uh, pilots at Korean Airlines uh, uh, did turn around. And uh, if you fly Korean Airline, and I did yesterday night, be safe. It's one of the most safest, safest airline in the world. Uh, I tell you this small story why. <clears throat> uh, to show that Koreans are fast learners under one condition. You learn fast if the analysis is right. So uh, my observation and my conclusion based on these Korean airline stories and the Seoul ferry tragedy is that we, you need to understand, you Korean and many, maybe some foreigners, if you <coughs> want to have some foreigners like me joining the debate, and if the analysis of the tragedy is right, then the solutions will be right, exactly in the case uh, of the Korean airline uh, 15 years ago. Now, um, after this introduction, uh, let, let's turn to the cause. Let, let's try to understand the causes of the Seoul tragedy. And uh, I would immediately uh, make a distinction uh, between direct and indirect causes. I mean, about direct causes, I mean, they, there is not one day in the South Korean media where another cause is proposed. 
and I try to follow the Korean uh, media and the, uh, so one day it is the responsibility of the owner of the ship and the other day it's the responsibility of the, uh, of the captain of the ship and the third day it's the responsibility, even read that it was a responsibility of the Japanese because it was a Japanese ship and well, of course, Japanese are always responsible by definition <laughs> and they, and they, and then why did the kids didn't take any, any initiative and why did the guard cause did not intervene and why was the president not really informed uh, on time? And you have this kind of uh, explanation, which are all true. All of them are true on a daily basis. So you have an accumulation like any, any accident. You know, any accident is the uh, unexpected conjunction of parameters which should never meet. Okay, that's the definition of an accident. These parameters are apart, and suddenly, you know, like a storm, they happen to, to meet in conjunction, and this provoke these accidents. And I certainly would not deny uh, the authenticity of all these causes. If the ship has been, if the ship been more modern, if the uh, uh, if anybody had to take an initiative, and so on and on, the accident would not have been as dramatic as it was. And I cannot add, as an outsider, any more information or data because you don't have all of them, but you already have a lot of them. And, but once you have all these data, I mean, what, what out of them? I mean, nothing. You cannot do very much about them. Okay? You can try to fix here and there, but I think you will never go to the deep reasons of this accident and what it means for the Korean society. So I think we need to shift together to a second level of explanation, uh, which we could call the deep causes or fundamental causes, not only of this accident, but any kind of accident of this type, those which happened in the past, we mentioned Korean Airline, and mostly those uh, which uh, could happen in, in the future. And I have listed uh, six of these the, uh, deep fundamental reasons cause uh, for uh, this kind of tragedy. You can find more, you can find less, but it's a way to try to organize uh, uh, our, common, uh, our common thinking. The title of the conference, as Dr. Amma said, being the state and the citizen safety, I was wondering about the role of the state in the South Korean society. I mean, the, uh, since the beginning of the modern South Korean state in the early 60s, I mean, the, there has been a tendency uh, within the uh, South, Korean, South Korean state I mean, to embrace many responsibilities, in a way too many responsibilities. It's a very centralized state. And the centralized state I mean, wants to take care of everything at the you know, smallest detail. And the, uh, when you take care of too many responsibilities, I mean, you don't do it correctly, you do it superficially. I mean, in, a very comp you know, in the 1960, you could decide for everything, you know, in which direction the uh, economic strategy uh, should go and the, how the people should behave and what the education system should be. I mean, they, like in France, I mean, after 1945, I mean, in the reconstruction period, the government is the only entity uh, which has the data and the capacity, human capacity, and to take all the decisions and to give a, a strategy and to show the way to, to the nation. But this is not true in a very sophisticated society, very sophisticated economy uh, uh, that the South Korean society has say, yeah, become. And in a way, there is a contradiction between the ambition of the state, which still wants to assume all responsibility and the sophistication of the society. So I think the, my first observation is that the, uh, the South Korean government needs to refocus on what are the priorities of a modern state. And the priority of a modern state is clearly, and this is why states have been built initially and historically, uh, to preserve, to protect the safety of the citizens inside and outside. Outside, I won't elaborate. You live in a very dangerous part of the world, and I do think uh, that the South Korean government is up to its task regarding the external safety of its citizen. I'm not sure it's up to its task um, to take care of the daily uh, life and the daily safety life 
of the uh, Korean people within Korea. And wh when I talk about daily safety, you have to look not only at tragedy like the Sewol accident, but also you have to look at the uh, safety of the people I mean, you know, crossing the street in a big city like Seoul. I mean, they, uh, I won't elaborate on that, but Seoul is a dangerous city because there is not enough concentration of the safety of the citizens. Uh, the country has become urbanized, I mean, a lot of cars, a lot of traffic, but this all has been forgotten in the name of modernization. Uh, number, number two, second fundamental cause after this re necessary refocusing of, of the state um, is the excessive centralization of the state in its decision process. We all know that. It's not new. I mean, the, uh, uh, I mean through experience, I mean, I've been invited at the Blue House by many presidents and I was always struck by the fact that everything was going up to the president, that, that he had to make decisions at the most minor details and for uh, causes and problems which should never should have reached the Blue House. And they, uh, when you have such a concentration of power uh, at the center, and uh, inevitably it does delay the response. It does delay the response. Uh, in a modern state, uh, not only uh, the decisions should be decentralized, but local initiatives should come first. And the uh, head of government uh, should only be an arbiter uh, when the decisions at a local level uh, seem not correct or not adapted to the situation. So you have a system, you have a political system, which is at a, a, a top-down decision process. In any modern country, uh, the uh, decision process is not top down. It's from the uh, basis, from the roots to the, uh, to, to the top. And the top intervenes only after mistakes have been committed at the local level. So there is a kind of a necessarily uh, intellectual, political, and administrative revolution which is to be implemented. Um, we use more and more, you use more and more here uh, in South Korea, the notion of civil society. Uh, civil society is a, uh, uh, is a general world, but what, what does it mean? It means that the, the South Korean people, being more and more educated, are, are totally able to take decisions uh, which are good for themselves, uh, be it in terms of safety, education, the uh, local management, and the uh, industrialization, infrastructure, and so, and so on and on and on. Uh, so the civil society uh, is heavily represented now in South Korea by local government, NGOs, and so on. So the uh, central government should be an arbiter uh, if the civil society doesn't reach a consensus, but not the other way around. And certainly, if the process had not been a top-down process in the civil tragedy, probably the civil tragedy do, would not have this a uh, terrible consequence it had because local decisions would have been taken at the local level and they were not taken, we don't know, but probably because some people at the local level were listening, were waiting, sorry, waiting for uh, orders from the top which didn't come in time. Uh, my, my third observation um, about the deep causes of what happened has to do with the uh, education system and mostly for the civil servants. I, mean, uh, I won't insist on that. I mean, it's a permanent debate. I mean, the, uh, uh, the old debate about what is called Confucianist education in South Korea. Uh, I'm a, a bit embarrassed by this term Confucianist because poor Confucius, I mean, uh, you know, his philosophy was extremely complicated. And in a way, it has been reduced to a very simple definition, everything which is uh, based on a hierarchy and not discussing the orders of your elder is called Confucianist. But okay, let's call it Confucianist to make it simple, uh, knowing that Confucianism has not much to do with the, who Confucius really was and wrote. But it's clearly uh, evident uh, that the so-called Confucianist tradition played a very negative role in the behavior of the old people um, involved in this tragedy, including the children. 
Uh, when at school you are educated uh, and you are told that you should never move without an order from your teacher, you don't move. And apparently this has been the case uh, in the Sea World tragedy. Uh, uh, the, uh, the other ex extreme, uh, which is the American education system, uh, which in my, in my mind goes a bit too far, I mean, France being in between, is that the, uh, um, as at a very young age, you're uh, invited to take initiatives and not to respect what your teacher is telling to you. So you have the two extremes. Uh, and the, and, but clearly, I mean, South Korea is discussing since a long time about uh, uh, training the children at a very young age to take initiative, to be more react reactive. Huge progress has been done, and I can see that when I discuss here at universities uh, with, the, uh, with the students. But still, uh, the traditional education system uh, does dilute kind of the uh, creativity and reactivity when the people at any age are confronted with an immediate threat against their safety. They are not, you know, uh, many people in the media said, but how come that, you know, nobody reacted and everybody stayed in place? And uh, I think it, it has to do with the South Korean culture. It has to do with the people the way, you know, the people the way they, they were trained. They were, wait, they were waiting for a solution from the top and the solution never happened or came uh, too, too late. And they, uh, this uh, Confucianist culture, of course, is pervasive uh, within the South Korean government. And the, uh, uh, I mean the, the South Korean government is, uh, in spite of all the historical disruption, civil war, uh, which took place in South Korea, still there is, like always at the government level, a continuity uh, between the uh, state culture of the past going back to centuries ago, to the uh, pervasive culture we still exist today. And there, there is a, uh, still a, a in the uh, state hierarchy kind of a, I wouldn't call that a um, Confucianist, I would call that kind of an imperialist behavior, okay? We know best because we are at the top. And this imperialist behavior is something which is extremely difficult to change. Uh, it cannot be changed uh, through only, you know, uh, discourse, speeches, and uh, uh, I will improve myself. No, I mean, this requires changes in the institutions. So the civil tragedy, if you, if you want to go to the end of the process, if you want to go to the end of the analysis, uh, should require uh, not only kind of, you know, in-depth analysis means I've been wrong, I'm sorry to have been wrong, I will never do it again. No, no, that's not the way politics works. Uh, uh, politics do require a change in the institutions and maybe a change in the constitution, giving more power to the uh, local government, giving more power to the civil society. And uh, so just to talk about it and to say sorry is okay, but to say sorry is not enough. You have to go beyond that, and you really have to think about the way the government is governed and the way uh, the constitution is is, wor is working. Uh, number uh, five about the um, quarrel and explanation and the uh, deep causes of a, of what happened. Is the old debate on regulations, and the, uh, so some did say, well, it's uh, yeah, the tragedy happened because there were too many regulations. And some others say, well, it did happen because there were not enough regulations. And a third school said, well, uh, the problem were not regulation or not regulation. The problem was corruption. So uh, the problem, there were regulations, but they were not respected. <laughs> and uh, my position is that, the, uh, uh, first of all, uh, to strike the right balance uh, between regulation and deregulation is extremely complicated. <laughs> it's extremely complicated. It's very difficult to say this is a line you can't cross. And they, uh, so it's an open debate. And they, uh, there is no regulation all necessary. Deregulation is also necessary. Uh, but it's only at the end of a very long discussion process that you can say this is the right level of regulation, which brings me to the debate on corruption, which is very much connected to the debate on regulation. 
Corruption uh, in South Korea, I wasn't supposed, somebody told me I wasn't supposed to talk about corruption, but uh, I can't avoid it. I mean, the, uh, uh, because uh, corruption is not an ethical problem. Uh, it's not, you know, because the uh, uh, South Koreans are I mean, culturally corrupt, it's part of a civilization that you have a lot of corruption affairs emerging here and there. This is not the, this is not the case. Corruption appears in situations where the regulation is, regulation is not clear. And so it's easy to cross the line. And the, uh, so corruption is always a consequence of the wrong balance between regulation and deregulation. There are very famous examples uh, in many countries. For example, the famous example, which is the academic example about the uh, um, uh, custom duties. When you have 200 custom duties to export or import as an excess of regulation, this is an immediate source of corruption in any country. Because you only to shift, you know, uh, to change the definition of what you import or what you export, and then, you know, you, you have place for corruption. If you reduce the number of export or import duties, well, there is no way that you can cross the line, and there is no room left for corruption. So in this case, uh, and, and more generally, I think uh, South Korea uh, should get, I mean, they taking the Seoul ferry tragedy as a uh, starting point. Uh, I think it's a good starting point to, to think about a corruption and understand that corruption is not a cultural problem. Corruption is not, a, it is an ethical problem, it's, but it, it is basically a problem which is rooted in the institutions. The institution, the way they have been devised, are the real source of corruption. I won't elaborate on that. Uh, number six, and my sixth and last observation about what I call the deep uh, causes, the drama, and, and the, uh, the state not being focused enough on, on safety. Uh, it is true, and the, uh, that was one of my immediate reaction when I learned about the civil tragedy, that the South Korean government since 50 years have been like uh, obsessed, maybe it's a strong word, but extremely focused on modernization. So everything which is modern or brings modernity to the country or is an incentive to uh, exports has uh, been the priority and gathering a lot of attention and a lot of financement, okay? And they, uh, therefore, you have the best airport in the world, uh, but if you take a boat in South Korea, uh, you go back to kind of a third world country situation because, you know, boats and, the, uh, and uh, local uh, ships and, the, and the local harbors, I mean, they, uh, um, First of all, this doesn't bring any money. It's not part of the modern image of South Korea that you want to project abroad. So there's been a deep, there is a, a, a deep divide, and we know about that between two Koreas. I mean, the, the, the modern Korea, uh, which has concentrated I mean, all investments and all energy and with brilliant successes, uh, but there is a kind of a forgotten Korea uh, which, you know, did not appear as a priority. And clearly, I mean, this kind of transportation going from small island to small island, it's not a profitable business. Uh, it is really kind of an invisible Korea. And this invisible Korea suddenly became visible. And the tragedy has revealed an imbalance between two kinds of Koreas, and I would say two kinds of citizens. First class citizens, well-educated, going through brilliant university, uh, getting brilliant jobs, well-paid in major companies, and a second-rate Korea. Uh, I don't mean, I've been criticized by a member of the ASEAN team on that, I don't mean that they, all the children on the Seoul ferry belong to Korea number two. I said that they happened to be caught into Korea number two. They certainly didn't know that they were uh, when, when they boarded the Seoul ferry, they didn't know that they were going from Korea number one to Korea number two, but they did. They did. So uh, this imbalance between the uh, Korea number one and Korea number two has been discussed since many, many years. 
uh, here at Assan, I mean, uh, we had the opportunity to talk about it. I mean, I did personally talk about it many, many times. And there is a problem here. There is a problem here uh, by once again this kind of obsession of Korea number one and forgetting about Korea number two. So these are some. Okay, I, I, I stop here. I could go further, but there's six ideas which came to my mind when I learned to the, about the Seoul tragedy. So where do we go from there? Uh, what, what is to be done? <laughs> um, I think a, um, the, the current moment could be a decisive, mode, a decisive mo moment to modernize the South Korean state. And uh, why? Because uh, you are confronted to a situation which is not unique in Korea. Uh, the uh, modern economy and the civil society through economic development, the development of education and globalization things have gone very fast, okay? Uh, the only entity which is not changing very fast is the, is the state, everywhere, in every country, in every country. And uh, I think, I wouldn't say in Korea more than in other countries, but it's true, for example, if you look at the use of modern technology, I mean, the, uh, the South Korea current government is anything but modern on the number, the evolution of the civil service in terms of education or number has not adapted, is not being adapted to the technological revolution. I mean, internet and everything uh, which surrounds modern technology has totally transformed the economy, totally transformed the society. It has not transformed the state. So I think uh, this is a good opportunity, as I said before, to refocus on what is essential and safety is absolutely essential, and uh, safety can be provided or guaranteed, and I will make a distinction on that by, by the government. And I think that uh, to rebuild a state, and um, this is valid for South Korea, but it's valid for many other governments to confront it to the same discrepancy between the modernization of the society and the modernization, or lack of modernization of the administration. I think uh, we should, or you should enter in a uh, vital distinction uh, between new rights uh, and who manages these new rights. Uh, to, to, be a, to be a bit clearer and elaborate on that. Okay, let's say that the government guarantees to you uh, your personal safety or the government guarantees to you that you will all have access to health care or the government guarantees to you um, that you all have access to a decent education or guarantee to you that nobody will fall in poverty and if you are old, that you will all get a decent pension. Okay? Those are new rights which are guaranteed by the government, by the state, to the people. That does not mean that the government has to manage all these new rights. On the contrary, I think the government nowhere in, is in a position to manage the best, these new rights. New rights can be managed by uh, three kinds of organization. They can manage, be managed by the public sector. Well, the police, typically the police or the military, this is direct public sector management with a decent education, of course. But it calls also it can be managed by the private sector. I mean, the uh, water distribution, transportation, this is a guarantee by the state of a right, but it doesn't mean that the state has to manage uh, transportation. And it doesn't mean that the government has to manage pension to the old people, for example. It can be subcontracted to the private sector. It's okay as long the uh, transfer, the contract, is totally clear and transparent. So it's not a question of who manages the new right. The question is about transparency and efficiency. Well, in France, I mean, clearly, I mean, the, uh, most of the uh, transportation and water distribution now and a lot of health care uh, was, in the past, was managed by the government, is now managed by the private sector under control and after transparent bids and uh, according to very clear regulations. So I think the best deal to modernize the state and the best direction, it's, it, by the way, um, it's a kind of program which has been very well um, 
uh, in Europe implemented by a country like Sweden, also Denmark and Austria, and to a certain part also um, in the United Kingdom, making this distinction between new rights and who manage the new rights. So you have the uh, public sector can manage, private sector can manage, and also the non-profit sector can manage. Uh, just uh, a couple of months, I, uh, ish, I published, released a book in Korean here about philanthropy in America, and I was struck by the fact that the, this so-called non-profit sector was practically non-existent uh, in South Korea. And the non-profit sector, uh, in terms of uh, improving the life of the citizens and bringing new rights to the citizens, and I, come on, I, I mentioned safety in one second, sometimes extremely well managed by the non-profit sector. i give you an example. Many of you, I'm sure, are familiar with the United States. And you know that in the United States, if anything happens to you, you call 911, okay? 911 was created by a non-profit foundation. It is non-profit still today, okay? So you call 911, and then from 911, they dispatch you to the right service, the hospital, fireman, or psychiatrist, or whatever. <laughs> uh, but it shows that in, in a, uh, to guarantee the safety of the people, which is such an uh, open field in a way, which impact on all the aspects of your life. I mean, the, there is no profit to be made. Okay, there's no profit to be made when your life is in danger. We, we will make profit on that. No one. Okay, the government is always a bit slow to respond. You know, do we have to respond? Should we ask for orders? Should we, you know, wait for orders? So you have in this field, which is safety, but I could give you many other fields. I mean, the non-profit sector, which is totally uh, in its infancy. Uh, in South Korea, and this is why I published this book. The nonprofit sector is a way to improve the rights, the quality of life, and the safety of the people. So there is direct relation. But could, to put it another way, uh, there is a huge mistake to, not to be made to say that a modern country is based on a distribution and sometimes opposition between state and market. Actually, our modern society are based not on two pillars, but on three pillars, which is the state, the private sector, the market, and the non-profit sector. In a country like the United States, once again, in the non-profit sector do represent 10% of the economy, which is huge. 10% I mean, of the US economy, I think, is more than all South Korean economy altogether. And when I mentioned the, the, the non-profit sector, I mean, that doesn't mean that you need to have a lot of money to be very wealthy, to be a participant. I mean, they, in America, but also in France, the nonprofit sector is mostly based on volunteers. So what's important in our society is not necessarily the money you give, it is the time you give. And in America, which is far from being a perfect society, but we, what, there are things to learn in America and other things not to learn, the fact that everyone in America is devoting part of its time to a cause which cannot be guaranteed neither by the government nor by the free market is absolutely essential. I'm sure all of you, you have at least one hour a week uh, which could be devoted to a cause uh, and kind of a fulfill fill a gap between government and, uh, and the market. And taking care of your neighbor, you know, what about the old lady living by herself next door? Who will take care of her? Not the market, not the government. You could do just by living next door, you know, and by knocking at her door once a week, and just to be sure that this old person is safe and that she doesn't need food, water, and some kind of health care. So I do think that also one of the answers to the question, what about safety? We should have a large concept of what safety means. Okay? Safety all along your life, not only to be safe when you cross the road, not only to be safe when you fly a plane or you take a ship, but to have a safe life demands that somebody next to you, as a volunteer, will look at you from time to time. And this, what, this is exactly what I mean by the necessity for a third, um, for called sometimes third sector, or non-profit sector. This is a direct consequence, a direct link between the civil tragedy, the concept of safety, and who is in charge of safety. 
If you say only the government, you are wrong. If you say only the free market, you are wrong. No. There are three partners in this game. If you want to implement not total safety, but uh, a better safety. And once again, and uh, I'll come back as I started with the Korean airline precedent, and the uh, a culture shock is needed, uh, but only after a right analysis. I do not think, and I'll be a bit uh, rude about this, that the uh, government itself or even parliament itself or only official elected are in the best position to bring the right analysis. The right analysis from the very moment that uh, it brings uh, in the open a discussion about the constitution, the size of the state, the responsibility of government, the type of education you get. I mean, uh, you need to bring uh, everybody on board. Of course, representatives of the civil society in South Korea, but also foreign experts interested in South Korea who may bring, like in the uh, Korean airline accident, a different view of things and help you, if you wish, uh, to a... Uh, to bring about a good analysis and better solution. And uh, I, I think this is that what we all uh, owe to the victims of the Seoul tragedy. I think it's our duty to make decisions uh, which wouldn't be superficial, but once again, as I said at the very beginning, to consider the Seoul tra tragedy as a uh, starting point for a, bit, a better and, and a safer South Korea. Thank you very much indeed for your time. Thank you very much. So now we will uh, take questions uh, from the audience. If you could, we have microphones ready. So if you could uh, briefly identify yourself first and then uh, make a, uh, ask a brief it, question. It can be in than, Korean because... Uh, yes, and it can be in Korean. If you speak English, you can ask a question. If you have a question, Life. It won't be in Korean. <laughs> I could try, but the English would probably work better. Okay. Leif Eric Easley, I'm an Asan uh, research fellow and also uh, an assistant professor at Iwa Women's University here in Seoul. Pleasure to see you again, sir, and thank you for your excellent uh, lecture. Question about how you weave together a cultural explanation an institutional explanation, and then a social explanation at the end. And, and I'd like to hone in on how you brought up Japan as an example. Uh, Japan is uh, often a foil for South Korea. But something that I've been fascinated uh, to observe while reading about the heart-wrenching uh, coverage of this tragedy uh, day in and day out for the past uh, month and a half is how often Japan has been brought up as an example of a safe society uh, from which Korea needs to draw lessons. And many of the examples given, uh, particularly with the history of Japan's ferry disasters, which then required and brought about institutional change, make institutional arguments. But you sometimes hear cultural arguments made from the Japanese side but oh, Japanese are so safety conscious and you know, their, their counterparts in Korea are so focused on a bali bali get, get there fast and uh, this whole soul searching over uh, the, the pace and speed of modernization and Japanese say, well, Koreans think that they've already surpassed us or caught up with us or, or something like this. <laughs> um, and so you sort of hear institutional and cultural arguments uh, across the, uh, uh, the, the international exchange here. And then I think you w wove them together and sort of made a social uh, argument, not just about the relationship about the, the state and the society, but particularly the role of the society uh, in, in filling space that maybe the, sp the state isn't filling, but the state perhaps shouldn't even be trying to fill. So you could say a little bit about how to square the, the circle of these, these different uh, cultural and institutional and social approaches, I'd, I'd be grateful. Thank you. Well, th thank you for your observation. And of course, there is not a clear cut and final answer to your question. Uh, if, we, if we look at the, uh, uh, Japan, of course, everybody wa was struck by the, uh, uh, by the way the Japanese did cope with the Fukushima tragedy. 
And the, uh, so some decisions were a bit slow to arrive, and they, because they did require uh, government decisions, and this, that was the slowest part of the uh, decision process. Okay? And, but at the local level, uh, two things uh, happened. First, I mean, the, uh, the, um, at the local level, uh, the provinces and the city halls have a lot of responsibility. Uh, much more than in South Korea. So the institutions are, are much different, much different, okay? Um, a, a, uh, Japan is very much more decentralized than, than Japan than South Korea. This may be kind of a uh, institutional explanation. The social explanation is more complicated, but it does exist. I mean, the, uh, uh, if, you, if you live in, the, uh, in Japan, and it's been my case, I mean, the... Uh, um, you uh, discover the importance of the notion of neighborhood. Uh, you are part of a neighborhood, okay? And uh, uh, being part of the neighborhood, uh, each one, and mostly the women, they have a lot of uh, local responsibilities. And risk, natural risks, uh, being part of the uh, daily life of the Japanese people, all neighborhoods are organized at a local level, and when uh, a disaster, minor or major does occur, everyone knows what is to be done. As you know, the children are trained at school how to behave in case of earthquake. Women know what to do and men know what to do. So there is a permanent training which starts at a very young age at the neighborhood level. And this is deeply rooted in the history of the, uh, Japan. And of course, you cannot reproduce uh, this kind of history uh, in South Korea. But the, the, the idea, the notion of uh, organizing the people at the neighborhood level and giving women a specific responsibility, I think uh, this can be learned, uh, especially in South Korea, uh, where the, the, the women do participate very little in the workforce. Uh, among the OECD countries, uh, South Korea happened to be the country where the number of women uh, working uh, is the lowest. That means they are basically at home, and they have not much to do. And uh, they are supposed to be at home to have many children, but in fact, they are so bored that they only have one, uh, which is the average in South Korea. So I, I had a debate two months ago with the minister for, she's minister for family affairs, Ms. Cho, yes. And, uh, uh, and I think that, yep. And uh, uh, my argument with her was the empowerment of women uh, was, is a priority for the South Korean society. And uh, I was not, that was before the Sewol tragedy two weeks before, so I could not imagine that this tragedy would occur, but the tragedy in a way reinforces uh, my position to say that the weakness, one of the major weaknesses of the South Korean society is the lack of empowerment of women. And this could be, the tragedy could be used in a way in order to empower women uh, with kind of social responsibilities um, which nobody is taking care of a, uh, uh, until, uh, until now. So uh, this is, I, I would answer globally to your question. There is a long cultural tradition of be prepared to the next earthquake or the next, next fire, get organized at a neighborhood level, uh, give very specific responsibilities to the women in the village, and this does not belong strictly to the Japanese culture and history. There are certain aspects of what I describe which I think can be transferred uh, to the uh, South Korean uh, society, which means that the uh, government and local representatives, civil servants, would lose uh, part of their current powers. And they would have to admit that the neighborhood organization is in the best position to make decisions. So you will have a kind of a conflicting situation in transition period where we will transfer responsibilities from the government to the so-called civil society. But what you describe, uh, this Japanese story or example, uh, is something which could be a source, of, a source of inspiration for South Korea. Thank you. Next question. Yes, way, way in the back first. Yeah, 
중요성을 말씀해 주셨는데 근데 이번 참사는 그런 삼섹터뿐만 아니라 그 종교 집단을 빙자한 불법 기업 집단의 그 행태가 있습니다. 좀 민감한 얘기인데 프랑스에서도 그런 문제가 발생해서 거기에 대해서는 또 어떻게 생각하시는지 그리고 어 이번에 그 세월호 참사로 인해서 지금 지명 수배된 그 유병헌 기독교 복음 침례라는 그쪽의 그 수장께서 그 가족분들이 지금 프랑스로 도피해 있다는 걸 알고 계시는지 그리고 이런 <웃음> 이 3섹터 문제도 중요한데 정부 그 다음에 기업 그러니까 프로핏 섹터하고 논 프로핏 섹터 그 다음에 그 3섹터 이런 것도 중요한데 그 우리나라에서는 그 종교 집단이 좀 미성숙한 채로 남아있는 게좀 문제라고 생각을 하는데 프랑스에서는 어떻게 그런 쪽에서는 접근을 하시는지 좀 묻고 싶습니다. But maybe we are not well informed. But uh, yeah, we we couldn't find him. We couldn't find him in France. And uh, but you will you will know as soon as we, we we find him. And uh, the problem with uh, Mr. Yu is that he has many names. Uh, so maybe he's hiding under a, a different name. We absolutely don't know. And uh, uh, the, you, you mentioned that President Yu was a, a protected by kind of a uh, cultural uh, sect. Um, that's your that's your that's your problem. And uh, it's true in France. It's true in South Korea. Sorry, but not in France. That the uh, some cult, some a uh, religious sect are being created only for tax purposes, who protect corruption, and they are. Act like more private army uh, for these people, and uh, this needs to be regulated. Um, in in France, I don't say it's perfect, but we have a law uh, which makes a clear distinction uh, between what we call established established religions, uh, who do have the total uh, rights, uh, which goes with the uh, freedom of expression and of organization. And the, uh, the law makes a distinction between these uh, legitimate uh, churches and, uh, and, uh, and, and cults, uh, which are built artificially uh, to protect private interest. Uh, so uh, maybe you have to look closely uh, at the French law and also at the American law, uh, which is more tolerant vis-a-vis -vis religious groups and the French law, but which also makes a distinction in the tax code uh, because you can get tax deduction in the United States for a lot of religions, but you must uh, fill a certain number of criteria uh, to be sure that the, um, uh, the organization for which you ask a tax deduction has not been created artificially only Uh, to protect your tax interest. So maybe, and very probably, there is kind of a weakness uh, in the way I mean, religious organizations are organized uh, in South Korea. Also, um, this kind of law is, I think, necessary. Uh, they have to be devised in a very careful manner uh, so that uh, you... ...where to get rid of religions you don't like. Uh, but in between the American regulation system and the French regulation system, I think South Korea can and should um, build a law uh, which would avoid uh, President Yu uh, to be protected by what seems more like a, a, a tax evasion system and, uh, and private army. But um, I, I, you probably know, know more than uh, you do. Uh, than I do on this. Now, you, um, uh, I want to be uh, precise uh, on a remark I made and you made. I mean, uh, I made this distinction, very rough distinction between three sectors, I mean, market, government, and non-profit. 
And uh, things are a bit more complicated. You have interaction between the three sectors. I mean, sometimes in the philanthropic organization, well, the money comes from the free market. So if you don't have an active free market, you don't have philanthropy. Uh, but also philanthropy uh, is not only about wealthy people, as I said before. So uh, I give these three pillars uh, just to facilitate the understanding of how a modern society works. And it's never pure, it's never perfect, but I do insist on this distinction because what I call the third pillar of philanthropy is uh, very often or confused with wealthy people only or uh, totally ignored. And once again, I think that the most important factor in the third, the third pillar of philanthropy, the most important factor is volunteers. And of course, volunteers need to be organized through NGOs and regulation and all that. We have a representative of the French Embassy. I hope you will <laughs> confirm that my informations are OK regarding uh, President Yu. With the, nothing has changed since uh, 8 o'clock this morning, 8 yen. Uh, no? Still true. <laughs> Uh, thank you very much. Uh, my name is Dr. Jung Kim from Gyeonggi University, and I missed my morning uh, class in order to listen to your lecture, because this is more important than lecture at the university itself. <laughs> when I f first heard the Seoul tragedy, my first response was to, is there, were there any Platon leaders among the group who could lead those students or civilians out of the tragedy. What I learned from the infantry school, that was a kind of survival exercise. We could save ourselves and also save our friends, colleagues, and then it, even these days, I'm sure I could save my family, and including my children and my friends. Uh, my question goes to, is there any French educational uh, a practice or a system which uh, does teach that kind of survival uh, kits or survival exercises. My experience in the United States was that the Boy Scouts teach that kind of thing to the young children. And then I'd like to know about the French cases, including whether they teach that kind of thing in the army or in the elementary school level. One thing I heard from the Japanese case was that after a, a similar accident in Japan, they decided to teach every ch school children how to swim. Such a thing. We do not have that kind of thing. These days, the, all the kids just go to private institute to learn English, foreign language, and that kind of thing. They do not include any physical exercises. So I, one of my suggestions to the government is to revive to have such a physical test in the examinations. So I'd like to know about the French case. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Sorry, uh, you, you missed your, uh, your uh, call this morning. And I hope you don't regret it by now. And the, uh, <laughs> And uh, um, I, will, I will start from the very end of your observation. Um, you say that uh, if I were asked, I would suggest to the government. And uh, uh, maybe this is the most important part of your intervention. Uh, because if the um, thinking process, uh, which has already started in the country, uh, is only between, I would say, bureaucrats, to make it short, Maybe this kind of very simple idea will not emerge. So what you say uh, is a proof that uh, the debate should really be a national debate involving every citizens, because citizens will come with very simple proposals, which are so simple that maybe they wouldn't you know, reach the mind of the superior uh, uh, people uh, belonging to the official strata of the administration. So I very much insist, uh, I wrote somewhere in a column that uh, South Korea should be transformed in kind of a national symposium, 
in order to, to think about what, what, what went wrong and what kind of new ideas we can uh, bring into the system. And uh, now, does this exist in other countries? You mentioned the Boy, the Boy Scouts in America, which is certainly one of the best schools uh, for boys and girls in the United States uh, to train, uh, to be confronted to this kind of, uh, of tragedy, tragedy, but also to be confronted to unexpected situation in terms of safety, but also uh, the kind of risks to which poor people can be exposed or people who are under addiction or alcohol influence. So the Boy Scouts, uh, non-profit sector, do play a decisive role. In France, uh, we are in an in-between situation. At an elementary schools, there are survival trainings, but I do think um, that the, uh, not much uh, time is devoted to that, and uh, I'm personally struggling to see an increase uh, in the quality and the quantity of uh, training which would be given uh, to the uh, French pupils at elementary schools and also high school. Usually it's done at the elementary school, but you reach, when you reach the high school level, you already have forgotten. And as we have suppressed uh, uh, the military service, uh, this kind of skills that you learned at the, in the army is not uh, implemented anymore. So I think there is kind of a weakness uh, in the French system right now, and that some of these skills uh, which were part of the military training uh, are vanishing. Japan is probably the most uh, complete system uh, in the survival training. It's really part of the curriculum at any age, and as we said before, answering question number one, it has to do with the long story of Japan as confronted to fires and the, an earthquake. But Japan is certainly the most, uh, the, not the best, but the, yeah, the, the most complete training system at any age, and it does bring benefits. I mean, the, let's imagine what the Fukushima tragedy would have been if the Japanese had not been trained uh, uh, to confront this kind of situation. And once again, I repeat myself, if you look at photos, if you follow you know, everything what happened, you would see how important the role of the women had been in this uh, survival strategy when implemented at Fukushima. Thank you. Next question in the back. <웃음> 우리 저 강사님 강의 잘 들었습니다. 아 제가 궁금한 거는 우리 한국 같은 경우에는 좀 특수한 사정이 있는 나라입니다. 1993년에 그 송수대교라는 그 한강의 다리 중 하나가 붕괴가 됐는데 그때도 이제 아침 8시 몇 분에 이제 붕괴가 돼서 등하교길에 많은 학생들이 또 이제 사망을 했고 또 많은 일반인들이 그 피해를 입었습니다. 그런데 그 사고 당시에 전 국민의 이제 관심과 또전 세계의 이목을 끌었습니다. 심지어는 그저 내셔널 지오그래피라는 그 국제적인 그 다큐 프로에서도 어 송수 대교 붕괴 사건이 그 인류 역사의 그 가장 그어좀그 좀 비극적인 사고로 아주 한 시간짜리 특집으로도 보도된 적이 있습니다. 저 같은 경우 개인적으로 그 관심을 많이 가지고 그 추적을 했습니다. 그래서 그 사건이 후에 이제 정부에서는 백서를 만든다고 그래서 백서를 만들었는데 그 백서가 발표된 게 언제 발표가 됐냐면은 사고 후 1년 예, 1년 후에 발표가 됐습니다. 근데 그 백서를 읽어 보니까 아무도 책임질 사람이 없다라고 백서가 그 당시 발표가 됐습니다. 그래서 어 이번 경우도 이제 제가 뭐 별제 이렇게 에에 아무도 책임질 사람이 없는 것처럼 에 그럴 게 가능성이 큰데 이번 세월호 사건도 제가 하나 여쭤고 싶은 것은 어 현장 지나 저 구조 명령을 받은 게 해양 경찰이 제대로 명령 수행을 안 했습니다. 이 사람들에 대한 그 처벌 같은 건 어떻게 에, 저 우리 강사님이 보실 때는 그 처벌이 가능한지 현장 구조 책임자들 아, 그걸 좀 여쭤보고 싶습니다. 
Well, uh, you know, like in the, uh, the, the, the bridge uh, disaster that you, you mentioned, I mean, the, uh, uh, you, you can decide uh, that nobody's responsible or everybody's responsible or some people are responsible. Uh, it's kind of a political choice in a way. I mean, uh, you say uh, in the case of the bridge, nobody was responsible. Why? Uh, because the, bid, the, the bridge was in a poor state. I mean, the, the bridge had been built years and years before, and uh, in a time where car traffic was much more limited, and so there was kind of a defect in the infrastructure because the build had been built for a different country, and the country has changed, okay? So in a way, accident happens and nobody's responsible, which is the case in many accidents. So nobody was responsible. Or you can say some are, res some are responsible and must be punished. So the owner of the ship must be uh, in the civil tragedy, Mr. Yu must be punished, and the, uh, the, the maritime police must be punished. Well, you can also uh, uh, take this kind of position, but uh, uh, did you really answer the question? Because then you ask, you need to ask you, why did Mr. Yu behave like that? Or why did the, the uh, maritime police behave like that? So in the case of the maritime police, I mean, they behave like that probably because they were trained to behave like that. So uh, if you punish them and then you replace them by another police who uh, receive the same kind of training, you haven't solved any problem. Okay? Maybe it's good for your conscience. Maybe it's good for the families. But you have changed nothing against the next, next accident or similar accidents do happen. Now, Mr. Yu, uh, I have no sympathy for Mr. Yu. Uh, but uh, uh, Mr. Yu tried to make money out of a business which is not profitable and which, to, which is to link hundreds of highlands all around South Korea where very few people uh, are living. And uh, how do you make a profit out of this? You just can't. You can only if you don't respect the regulation. So the question is not about Mr. Yu. The question is what kind of uh, uh, shipping infrastructure and what kind of transportation should exist uh, in order to link all these islands uh, around South Korea? So maybe this business should be, and this is not very free market oriented, but maybe this business should be subsidized. Okay? Maybe it's not profitable by definition, but maybe these people have a right to be linked to the mainland. Therefore, the government should intervene and there should be kind of a cooperation between the private sector and the government. But to trust the private sector with an activity which by definition is not profitable is an incentive to corruption and not to respect the rules. So this is not an excuse to, for Mr. Yu, but if you replace Mr. Yu by somebody else, you will be once again confronted with the same problem. So between the three positions, nobody responsible, punish the people who are directly responsible or everybody is responsible, my position is to think deeper to what I call, what I call the systemic deficiencies which explain the consequences with which we are confronted. We are offered with an opportunity, a tragic opportunity, but an opportunity to think more about the systemic changes which needs to be brought to South Korea, with a modern economy, a modern society, and a relatively obsolete state. Uh, next question. We have a student here, actually. <laughs> Hello, uh, thank you very much for your insightful lecture. Um, I'm an Asan Young Fellow at Asan Academy. My name is Park Yeon-soo. And I have two questions. Uh, first is about empowering the third sector, or the civil society. So we had a similar discussion with some of our young fellows. And what we thought was, it is obvious that, and I guess everybody could agree that we should really empower the civil society. But the question is how? We don't really see how the starting point is. And uh, some of the opinions we got, maybe the arguments were that, what if we try to do it by fostering those values in the education system? We talked about doing the safety education, and that is kind of possible by implanting it 
in the current Korean education system. But then again, this sounds like going back to the top-down decision-making process that you have pointed out as a problem. So what I'm trying to ask is, what could be the way to foster or implant those kind of ways of how people identify with these values of civil society by themselves without going through the top-down process again? And the second question is, you talked about the, uh, uh, the idea of um, those safety education within the neighborhood, and you talked about how women have the responsibility to do that. And I'm wondering if there is a certain reason of you being gender specific, of giving the woman those kind of responsibilities. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, by definition, and as you say, there is kind of a contradiction to uh, help the civil society to get organized, because if it's a civil society, you don't need uh, the uh, guidelines or, or laws or incentive, but uh, in the case of education, for example, in the, uh, uh, I'm sorry if I quote again the United States, uh, if you want to enter into college in the United States, you have to prove that since your younger age you have been active uh, in some kind of non-profit uh, activities. So it, it, it's part of your curriculum vitae. And uh, if you never did any, well, you, you start at uh, yeah, six, years, six years old, I mean by uh, selling limonade or chocolate chip cookies, okay? And they, uh, but then it's a long process, and so I think this is something which can easily be implemented and to decide, and that this would, by the way, uh, diversify uh, the, um, uh, the, the um, recruitment uh, to get into college and to get into college to have a recruitment which wouldn't be based only on uh, rote learning in private schools, but also to show that you have some uh, experience in real life and that this, this experience had been implemented uh, in the nonprofit sector. So uh, this can be legally implemented, or at least if not, if not at the national level, because you have many private colleges and private universities, but to tell private universities and private colleges that it would be in their interest and in the interest of the society to have a more diverse pool of students to add to the conditions to join the college and universities experience uh, in the nonprofit sector. I think this would be a very efficient way uh, to push uh, the young people in South Korea to take initiatives. The way, I mean, the form of the initiatives are for you to decide. Is it an NGO? I mean, are you helping the old lady next door? I mean, are you cleaning the park behind your building? And the, the, the second recommendation I would do is that uh, certain um, collective equipment, which are now uh, managed by a government, national or local, uh, should be trusted uh, to, the, uh, to private organization. I mean, this is being done, uh, of course, in the United States, but also in the UK, and start also being done in France. Uh, let's say we have a, a green park, a forest, a river, which is not in a perfect state. Uh, the government, local, national say, we won't intervene. You live nearby. After all, it's your neighborhood. It's what you see out of the windows of your college, of your building. You just take care of that. Uh, so give you the responsibility and give you the legal right, because also there are some legal transformation to be implemented, give you the legal right to take care of some collective equipment which would be managed by the private sector. So there are uh, two uh, possibilities which are simple to implement and which do require some government decision, neighborhood uh, or local government decision, and college and university president decisions. Now, uh, I... I uh, I'm being struck by talking with a lot of students in the, here in colleges and universities by the number of NGOs which already exist in South Korea. So we are not starting from scratch, actually. Uh, there is a very strong movement uh, within the younger generation to give uh, to many nonprofit organizations or to volunteer in many nonprofit organizations. But the scope is very small. 
uh, they don't know how to do, they don't know how to invest the money, but you know there are many websites also to help uh, finance uh, NGOs and participate into NGOs. So I'm quite optimistic that the, the movement is starting already at the grassroots level, and if you add to this spontaneous grassroots movement some kind of incentive, like the two and some more could come, uh, you would have the uh, interesting results as I said, South Korean are fast learners in, quite a, in a couple of years. One last question, Majima. Uh, oh, thank you very much. Uh, your lecture was very much helpful and instructive. I read uh, your book, uh, Rane de Cook, Shinoe Lubel. It was very interesting. <laughs> <laughs> your top list top expert on China. And uh, uh, I haven't spoken for about 50 years of English, so my English is poor. I, I'll put my question in Korean. This year, the Global Council of the Global Council the Global Council of the Global Council of the Global Council of the Global Council of the 한국은 1987년 민주화 이후에 절차적 민주주의는 그런대로 90% 이상 달성되었는데 이런 실체적 서브스탄티브 민주화 법을, 법의 준수라든가 법의 집행 엄격한 집행 이런 것이 잘 안되고 있습니다. 그래서 한국에는 제가 관찰 건데 편견인지 모르겠는데 기득관자의 법과 절대다수 국민의 법에 거의 두 단계로 되어 있습니다. 기득권자의 법이라는 것은 입법, 사법, 행정, 고위관료들과 대기업들의 합작, 컴플렉스, 그런 법 위에 있어요, 이 사람들은. 그래서 절대 다수 국민들은 법 아래에 있습니다. 그래서 그것이 하나 원인이고, 어, 또 하나는, 어, 관료부패, 누적된 관료부패와 기업과의 합작한 것이 이번에 그 세월호를 일으킨 결정적인 원인이라고 생각합니다. 거기에 대한, 아, 어, 선생님의 견해를 어, 여쭙고 싶고 또 하나는 이번에 제가 보기에는 세월호 참사가 한국 국민들에게 준 충격이 에, 미국에서 9.11 테러 어를 일으킨 오사마 빈 라덴이 미국에 준 충격보다도 데미지가 훨씬 더 크다고 봅니다. 그, 그런 점에서 어, 현상금을 지금 5억으로 인상했는데 현상금을 100만 달러 또는 그 이상 걸어야 빨리 잡을 수 있지 않겠나 그런 생각을 합니다. 어떻게 생각하십니까? 네, 이상입니다. 감사합니다. well, and uh, my position is to say nobody is responsible. It's a, uh, uh, I think uh, if you uh, stick to this interpretation of let's find the person who is responsible, I mean the, uh, you won't solve anything. I mean the, uh, that's kind of a maybe true. This person is one person is responsible. So what? Uh, so I think a uh, uh, scapegoating is not enough. I mean, the, the, the problems we are talking today, I mean, they, well, I mean, they are not, not new. They are not, I, mean, they, I participated in many symposiums at Assam uh, organized by uh, Dr. Ham, and they, we already had this kind of discussion, okay? What kind of education? How should people take more initiatives? How the, how the rule of law should be more respected? I mean, they, uh, we have this discussion for many years, actually. And things are changing, but extremely slowly. So, you know, what I hope, and I think that with the victims deserve, is that we go beyond the usual. We go beyond, you know, punishing one or two person. We go beyond, you know, having a commission, you know, drafting a white paper, and they will have this white paper in one or two years, and nothing will come out of it. I think we owe the victims and their family much more. I think the time is ripe, I and mean, I think you have to see the time and to say enough. Enough of the division between the two Koreas. I mean, enough of this state, which is rather obsolete. Enough of a kind of education which does not encourage initiatives. I mean, let's have I mean, the, uh, 
uh, a kind of organization and respect of law and a, uh, and a decent government uh, which would be as modern as the economy has become. I think we should see the moment we should seize the moment to get into this kind of transformation and have this kind of general debate. And because what we really don't need is one more white paper. This would have been wasted, okay? So my point is, once again, is not so much to discuss into details about responsibilities. Is it 9-11 or whatever? What, where is Mr. Yu? I mean, the, I care and I don't care. I mean, the, uh, what I would love to is that uh, we should end this discussion by saying this is a moment, okay? And this is a moment to seize, and once again, as an homage to the victim, you are going to transform this country and to bring the country in the modern world. Part of the country is already in the modern world. Part of the country is already globalized and modernized and open-minded. Part of the country is not. And I think this kind of reconciliation beyond politics, beyond parties, you know, beyond uh, name dropping, I think this is what we need right now. And this is what the civil tragedy could bring uh, to this country. But the decision is not mine. The decision is yours. I mean, they, uh, and they, uh, le once again, uh, let's make good use, if I may say so, of, uh, of this disaster and, and, build, and build a better country. And let's stop this kind of discussion that we have for many years, I think, uh, rule of law, corruption, and so on. No, no. This, we know. We know where the problems are, actually. We, all of us, we know. But it seems there is some kind of incapacity to uh, cross a threshold and go like Korean Airlines did, I mean, to, to be the most dangerous company in the world, to be the safest company uh, in the world. If, uh, if Korean Airlines did, I think South Korea can do it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Please join me in thanking Mr. Gisoma.